I love Zelda. Ever since I was but a wee lad, it's been one of my favourite series. The thrill of adventure, the puzzles, the music, the effeminate men. There's so much about Zelda that just makes me want to bust a Deku nut. But there are some sick individuals out there who hate Zelda so much that they are willing to spend thousands of hours in order to figure out how to get them over with as quickly as possible. These users, known as speedrunners, often find themselves at odds with one another. This is the Mini Scandals of Zelda Speedrun. Hi, I'm Mini Kudos, still here in the flesh room, and I've partnered with Geology yet again to tell you all about their fantastic products. Geology creates simple and effective skincare routines for you. Just you, Robert. This ad is now for Robert. After filling out a questionnaire about your skin and what needs improving, they hire a guy off Craigslist to sneak into your house at night and stock your cabinets full of the perfect skincare products just for you. They've asked me to say which of these products are my favourite and I'll be completely honest, I'm too dumb to know what any of these goofy little tubes do. But see that's the beauty of it, I can let geology handle all of that so I can keep space free in my brain for World of Warcraft lore and euphemisms. What I do know is that after using these products for only a couple weeks, my skin went from the texture of fruit leather to that of an uncooked pork shoulder. In a good way. The bros over at Geology have hooked me up with a mean discount for you guys. So if you want to join me on your own personal skin quest, use code MINIKUDO70 or scan the QR code in order to get a whopping 70% off their award winning skincare trial set. You can also get a bonus 50% off any extra skin hair or body products you add to your trial. Thanks once again to Geology for sponsoring this video. Let's kick this list off with one of the most devastating accusations ever lobbied in the speedrunning community. Not that Dream cheated, not that the Bada Bun guy faked his run, but that runner Torjay had a quick piss. I mean a fast wee. In 2016, User Midnight posted a side by side comparison of what was at the time Ocarina of Time's top two any percent runners. This comparison showed that in one of the game's final cutscenes, Runner Torjay's cutscene ended a full two seconds earlier than rival runner skaters. This might not seem like much, but remember this is any percent we're talking about, where runners can do anything and everything in order to reach the end credits as fast as possible. At the time, Skater had the world record at 17 minutes and 45 seconds, with Torjay just barely lagging behind with 17 minutes and 47 seconds. With times that tight, every second mattered, and Skater speculated that Torjay's Wii was wearing a bunny hood and for some reason ran the game faster than his own. Don't worry, you're not being hit with the Mandalorian effect, Ocarina of Time was a Nintendo 64 game. For various speed themed reasons, runners typically run Ocarina of Time on the Wii Virtual Console, which emulates an N64. As long as they play on an official Nintendo release of the game, any console, and certain emulators, are all legal for speedrunning, even if this is sometimes a scandal in itself, as we'll see later. Skater's expedient urination accusation was originally met with mocking, uh, because he said fast we in. That's pretty funny. But Torje felt that Skater was nervous about losing his record. Skater is actually making me mad because he's trying so fucking hard to discredit my work Lamal. Skater, unfortunately, didn't find the fast we joke very funny. I bet Danny B would have a 338 in glitchless if he had a fast Wii like me. Can you stop? Three months later, he was still going on about it. Way to try and stop the fast Wii meme. You're literally the only one who takes it seriously, lol. Well, can you stop making jokes about it because I got a lot of shit for something that's true, and I still do, so please stop for something that's true. See, this is why you get shit for it, Lamau. Wow, you're so mean, dude. It is. Now, here's the thing. Skater did actually have a point. But also, not really. Unrelated to Skater's shenanigans, the speedrunning community have been doing extensive research on the Wii's hardware, in particular how it relates to Ocarina of Time. Around 50 different community members submitted Wii samples for review, and it was discovered that there was in fact fast Wii's and slow Wii's. It turns out that the people who had installed homebrew anti-brick software in the event that their Wii contracted a UTI were inadvertently altering the load speeds of Ocarina of Time. These homebrewed Wiis were noticeably faster than their unmodified counterparts, making them highly desirable for speedrunning. However, since this involved the use of unofficial software, 
Homebrewed Wii was banned from all future dinner parties and Ocarina of Time speedrun submissions. So Skater was right? While Skater had technically stumbled upon an adjacent truth, that being the idea of fast and slow piss, it actually had zero bearing on his particular grievance. The community effort I just mentioned discovered that Ocarina of Time resets faster on modified Wiis, but has no actual effect on cutscenes like Skater claimed. Furthermore, resets weren't used on the particular any percent routes used at the time. So even if Torjay did have a fast Wii, it would have had zero impact on his time. Finally, they both had the same unmodified, slow Wiis. So if it wasn't the Wiis, what wheeze it? It turns out it was actually two factors at once. Firstly, cutscenes in Ocarina of Time can have a bit of randomness in their length. In this cutscene especially, there are certain randomized elements, such as the way that the rock debris spawns as it explodes out of the doorway. Given the N64's dated but very endearing graphical capabilities, even something as simple as this can have a notable effect on the cutscene's length. Still, this wouldn't be enough to account for the whopping two second difference between Skater and Torje. Instead, it turns out Skater was being betrayed by his own recording software. According to Jouster64, Skater used Amorak screen recording software in order to capture videos of his Twitch VODs in order to upload them to his YouTube channel. Clearly lacking the raw power of unregistered Hypercan 2. The Skater software would arbitrarily speed up and slow down while recording his Twitch VODs. These inaccurate recordings were placed side by side with Torjay's accurate recordings by user Midnight, and thus the beef was born. Just like the Beef Boys podcast. Put a whole episode here. Dr. Gay Hitler. <laughs> Skater would later apologize for his screen recording software, and nobody gave a shit about any of this ever again. <laughs> From fast wheeze to the Chinese, speedrunners will do anything to shave off those precious seconds. We've already established that even the most minute hardware differences can have big consequences in the speedrunning community. This brings us to one of the longest ongoing debates, speed versus competition. Speedrunning is all about going fast. So if you find an official version of a game or console that lets you run it quicker than before, it's only logical that you play on that version. But what if that version is obscure, expensive, or otherwise difficult to obtain? Does this inaccessibility add a barrier to entry that could ultimately harm the competitive scene of a game? That was the name of the game, or rather the console, when it came to the iQ. The iQ is an official Nintendo console released exclusively in China in order to circumvent the Chinese government's 2000 ban on home game consoles. This game console that you played at home somehow managed to circumvent the law, uh, possibly because it was a plug and play console with the games already preloaded. Given the ban on the rest of Nintendo's consoles, Chinese gamers resorted to piracy. As I'm sure you're aware, Nintendo regards software piracy as digital terrorism, but instead of forcing these pirates into the Nintendo Rehabilitation Center in Nanking, they offered them a legal alternative, the iQ. Named after the average Disneyland experience, this dumb piece of shit released in 2003 and looks like Mad Cats tried to recreate a Dreamcast. Apparently the idea of paying for a product that you've been quite content pirating didn't appeal to Chinese gamers and the iQ was a commercial flop. In 2011, it was discovered that this strange little Star Wars droid was actually ideal for speedrunning. Firstly, the Chinese text boxes complete faster than any other version. Since these text boxes spell out one character at a time, and a single character in Chinese is often the equivalent of an entire word in English, they were able to complete sentences much faster. On top of that, the updated hardware meant that load times were quicker than other versions of the game. This meant that the iQ was considered to be the best platform to speedrun the game on, with the exception of 100% runs. This is because 100% runs rely on a glitch that's only doable in version 1.0 or 1.1 of the game, while the iQ ran version 1.2. In 2013, Ocarina of Time speedrunner RunnerGuy2489 was gifted an iQ from user Callahan. This sparked the age-old debate of speed versus accessibility as Runner Guy was the only speedrunner in possession of an IQ at the time. Speedrunner ZFG spearheaded the anti-IQ sentiment, 
saying that there needs to be a balance between going as fast as possible while still promoting competition. An example given was how English players used to run on the English version of the game, while Japanese players used to run the Turkmenistani version. I mean the Japanese version. Over time, the English players migrated to the Japanese version for the faster tech speeds. And now both communities have a more lively competitive scene as a result. Were the IQ to become the de facto speedrunning device, it was feared that both price and availability would become major hurdles, making the barrier to entry for competitive speedrunning higher than ever. Runner Guy, meanwhile, believes that speed is the most important factor. He says that if competition was more important, all speedrunners would play on the English version as it's more accessible to everyone. Meanwhile, the Japanese version is still slower than the Chinese one, making it an awkward middle ground that satisfies nobody. In 2014, runner Nasissa, then Cosmo, used the IQ in order to achieve a new world record of 18 minutes and 10 seconds in the any percent category. While Nasissa had used the IQ to set a few records before, this one was a whopping 40 seconds faster than the runner in second place. Keep in mind that the previous story revolved around a two second difference. It was now believed that the only way someone could realistically compete for a world record was to obtain an IQ themselves. Discussions were held in dimly lit rooms by robed figures casting ominous shadows by blood red candles about whether or not the IQ should be its own separate category or not. Super Mario 64 speedrunners separate their runs depending on whether they play on the N64 or the Wii Virtual Console. So this wasn't an unrealistic pitch. Ultimately, it comes down to how outspoken the community is about it. Or rather, how much the community can piss off their moderators before they give in for their own sanity. As is often the way with these speedrunning controversies, the problem just fixed itself with the discovery of new run techniques. In this case, get item manipulation. Get item manipulation is a glitch so complex that even renowned physicist Stephen Hawking was unable to do it. For the sake of brevity, it allows you to acquire a crucial item much earlier than the game intended which became an integral part of any percent runs. Unfortunately for the IQ, it was unable to allocate enough memory in order to complete the glitch, and attempting it would crash the Chinese cheat box. With the IQ now rendered useless for a majority of the most popular speedruns, it fell out of the limelight and was later found dead after a fatal overdose in their Calabasas mansion. From the first 3D Zelda game to the last one they'll ever make, let's talk about The Legend of Zelda, the breath of the guy at the magic store. Zelda speedrunning seems to be cursed by optional accessories that cost more than a couple gold rupees. While the IQ was eventually routed into redundancy, amiibos are to this day the most optimal way to run Breath of the Wild. Amiibos are little statues that you can convince your mum aren't just toys, because they have a little NFC chip in them that gives you in-game benefits before she nags you about filling out that application to Wendy's for the third time. So just how useful are amiibos for speedrunning and what exactly do they do? Amiibos can be scanned into Breath of the Wild to summon in boxes, horses and cooking ingredients, all of which are incredibly useful for Breath of the Wild. The metal crates that the Guardian amiibo summons in let you stasis launch yourself across the map. Others summon an opponent who, unlike other horses in the game, doesn't need to be tamed and can immediately be mounted. They can also summon the cooking ingredients required to brew up a level three attack elixir, which gives naked twig wielding Link the edge he needs to take on Ganon. Now, acquiring a few 20 to $40 toys from EB Games seems pretty tame when compared to purchasing a 25 year old game console and a Japanese version of an equally old game. While scarcity and price might not be as big of an issue, it just feels cheap. In an age where companies are trying to monetize features that were once just included by default, Amiibos feel akin to purchasing items in a mobile game or gold in an MMO. In these instances, you're not being rewarded for your skill in game, but by your willingness to drop real money on digital delights. It'd be like if there was an ATM in the Shrine of Resurrection where Link wakes up, 
that skips you to the end credits for five bucks a pop. And so speedruns instead just became how fast speedrunners can feverishly type their credit card details in. The reason why I have a problem with Amiibos in the speedrun is that it is literally pay to win. Allowing the Amiibos in the any percent category makes a portion of the run feel like a mobile game with free to play mechanics. It's rewarding speedrunners for spending more money, not for being better at the game. Price and availability are still concerns though, which are only exacerbated in Breath of the Wild's longer categories. With modern glitches, Amiibos will save you several minutes in the All Shrines Cleared category. But at a certain point, they could save you upwards of an hour. In these runs, you had to use the same type of Amiibo multiple times. While you can only scan one of each individual Amiibo toy a day, you can scan multiple of the same type. Meaning for some of these runs, you would need upwards of 10 identical statues. Since nobody wants to drop $400 for a dozen identical Guardian Amiibos, many people turn to homemade illegal NFC Amiibo cards. Like the ones that my mate Josh lent me and then forgot about when I moved to Australia. On you Josh, you fucking idiot. Even if you are willing to drop the cash to get the competitive edge, there's been times when even just acquiring the Amiibos has been more trouble than it's worth. As you can see, Amiibos add an unnecessary level of complexity that a lot of community members would rather do without. Before the game was even released, there were already discussions about whether or not to ban Amiibos from speedrunning. These discussions continued well after release, with nobody able to come to a clear consensus. Despite the obvious flaws in Amiibos, speedrunners are also averse to adding in arbitrary categories or rules as this too adds unnecessary complexity. For example, most games have an optimal language that renders text the fastest, like we saw with Chinese in Ocarina of Time. However, these are never segregated to their own categories, despite being objectively faster. Tired of the constant bickering, a poll was posted to speedrun.biz or, or speedrun.eg or something. I don't know, man, I didn't really research this part very well. The vast majority agrees that there should be at least some kind of filtering for the Amiibos. We also evaluated whether it'd be possible to create a subcategory for the Amiibos. However, speedrun.com currently does not allow sharing runs between different subcategories. So what you would want is a general any percent category that shows all the runs and a subcategory based on that that only shows runs without the Amiibos as that one is more restricting. Speedrun.com decided to leave both Amiibo and no Amiibo runs in the same category, but allows users to filter within them. Much like the IQ, the discovery of new glitches has negated a lot of the benefits that Amiibos used to provide. Even still, at time of writing, the top three runners in both the Any% percent and All Shrines categories all got their times using Amiibos. <laughs> When you have so many runners, gamers, and glasses-wearing individuals focusing their effort on one game, it's no surprise that you find something like ACE. ACE is short for Arbitrary Code Execution. It involves using an offensive amount of glitches to make the game run code written by the player. This code isn't written using a keyboard, but through a combination of inputs from the controller and in-game data. ACE is used as part of the Ocarina of Time Any% percent run, where runners use location data of rocks in order to inject code into the game that skips them to the final credits. That is not a joke, that is real. They do that. Ace has dropped the world record down to a ridiculously low 3 minutes and 51 seconds. A far cry from the 1745 that Torjay and Skater were having a mouth spitting contest over early in the video. This provoked debate over whether or not any percent should mean to just hit the end credits or whether or not you should still have to kill the final boss. The old any percent strategy, as seen in the first two stories of this video, has now become its own category, known as Push Ganon in Front of an SUV. I'm not here to talk to you about three different category debates in one video. Instead, we're here to talk about the tragic misunderstanding of Triforce Percent. At Summer Games, done quite a bit faster than you'd expect, Save State, Duango AC, and Soren showed off the power of Ace on an unmodified Ocarina of Time cartridge in an unmodified N64. In order to achieve this, they used Tazbot, a tool assisted speedrun robot. For those who don't know, tool assisted speedruns are where you program in the exact button presses that you want on a frame by frame basis. This allows you to input commands at a speed that no human could physically do, allowing you to utilize glitches and speedrunning strategies that you would never normally see. When combined with Ace's ability to write code directly into the game, 
Tezbot was able to reprogram entire sections of the game in real time. The team behind this put an immense amount of effort into showcasing cut beta content, as well as finally realizing rumors that had been kicking around shady parts of the internet and fatherless children on the playground for years. Some of this cut beta content included an R-Wing from Star Fox, which was used to test Vol Virginia the dragon boss from the fire temple. They also showed off an unused beta model for a Kokiri child, an early, much less creepy version of the Great Fairy, and an unused McDonald's promotional tie-in temple. In addition to the beta content that was left on the cartridge, they were able to program in brand new features that paid homage to the many urban legends of Ocarina of Time. The running man, who challenges you to an unwinnable race in the original, is finally able to be beaten with the help of some new tricks. Enraged that you beat him, he then fights you in an admittedly pretty funny boss battle. Of course, the greatest schoolyard rumor of all was obtaining the Triforce. An early development screenshot shows Link standing in front of the triangular ridiculousness, and an empty space on the quest status part of the pause menu seems to imply that the Triforce was obtainable at some point, like all of the other items on the quest menu. Through some elaborate fan fiction, and an excessive amount of arbitrary code execution, the team shows off what it might have been like to obtain the Triforce in-game. At this point, things get a bit silly. After acquiring the Triforce, the little golden Toblerone offers Link the ability to see the future. Selecting this starts a fully voice-acted cutscene of Breath of the Wild Link and Zelda still running on the N64. They then ask the Twitch chat to type here together which is then rendered live in the cutscene. So why was what was essentially a celebration of Ocarina of Time a cause for controversy? It all came down to framing. While the runners made a point to say what was specifically cut beta content, they didn't make that same distinction for their own original content uh, for the sake of the narrative they were trying to tell. Outside of the clearly fake Breath of the Wild ending, the other original segments were almost too well done. This left a lot of viewers feeling as though they'd been deceived, especially those on Reddit. I guess I was missing the point or something, but I'm actually pretty pissed off that I was led to believe that this was all real until the ending. Why not be upfront about it being a ROM hack? My mind was being blown every few minutes only to have the rug completely pulled out from under me. It definitely was cool, but extremely misleading. He kept saying that the N64 and cartridge were at 100% original and no modifications were done to make you believe that this was all 100% beta content anyone could find on an Ocarina of Time game. But the reality is that they were hacking the game in real time using Ace and didn't admit it until the final few minutes. While the team did explain how Ace worked at the start, it was very jargon heavy and could easily be misinterpreted by a casual viewer or someone joining halfway through. Instead, the Breath of the Wild finale was when the penny really dropped for most people. I think them adding the Breath of the Wild part at the end was a mistake and what's causing all this. After watching it all, I understand because the presentation does feel like one of those YouTube videos where it starts out, this is all real, with it all feeling real. Till those last two seconds where the creator starts making it obvious then goes, oh, but it wasn't real, gotcha. This was my experience as well. I haven't been able to put my finger on exactly why, but my mind was blown until the Breath of the Wild part. Then it all felt kind of cheap. Not everyone felt misled though, and the vast majority of viewers felt like they were seeing a version of Ocarina of Time that the little shithead making up rumors on the playground could only dream of. Not gonna lie, this legit made me tear up. As someone who has played Ocarina of Time hundreds of times, seeing this being a thing after two thirds of my life was as if a long abandoned goal was accomplished for me. And for everyone who as a kid tried all these crazy rumors in order to reach an unattainable goal. Excellent work. This made me cry. Can't even put into words how meaningful this achievement is, but I can try. It's the manifestation of countless people's childhood dreams. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for making this. While they could have communicated a bit better and maybe dialed down the theatrics a little bit, it was still an amazing showcase of what's possible with Ace and a love letter to Ocarina of Time as a whole. And personally, I think that's just neat. Hey, if you like this one, you'll definitely like my video about Mario speedrunning scandals. Or why not check out the mini scandals playlist? full of hobby dramas from places you've never even heard of. Don't forget to check out Geology's fantastic products if you're in the market for some new skin.